The sign-up sheets will be outside the classroom at the place that will be posted at the end of the class. So don't break your neck trying to get out of the room, and, and don't run down the unfortunate TAs who are putting up the, the uh, sign-up sheets. They're, they're very valuable people not to be trampled on. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can all have the first writing assignment. The first writing assignment is uh, we, we sort of plan to coincide with your trip to the Metropolitans, so that you can spend some time there either before or after you meet your section, um, you meet the tour that you're going to go on, because it involves something that's in the Egyptian way. Uh, this is an extraordinary monument, uh, this temple that uh, was brought uh, here. Um, you'll find out more about why it's here, but it's sort of extraordinary to find an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian temple in Manhattan. And so we've asked you to think about it. Um, what, um, what, how does the location, the transfer of this temple from Egypt to the United States affect the way we understand it? Uh, what um, does you to find out, to think about its original function, what function it served, what it might have meant to the people who built it, and then what it might mean for us today. So it's a reflection about the museum, really, as well as about the, um, about the monument itself. Uh, what sort of power did this thing have in the course of time? What power did it have for the ancient Egyptians? What power did it have for us today? These are the sorts of things you know, we've talked a little bit about presentation and representation and seeing in, seeing in. Uh, these are the distinctions that you may usefully bring to bear on trying to think about this. So there's a lot to think about here, and if you need more guidance, please talk to your TAs about it. Okay, so that's another task for you to do while you're down at the museum uh, on a private attack. Yes, a couple of questions. When is the video, please? Well, oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> and yeah, uh, talk to your TA. When in doubt, <laughs> when, when, when in doubt, talk to your TA. So they, by the time we next meet them, uh, will have an idea of when this is due. Uh, we'll we probably give you about two weeks to do this. So uh, don't procrastinate. Uh, we want you to do this before the midterm. Um, okay, what next? Uh, something else. Oh yeah, there was another question. Or was it the same question? Okay, yes, something I keep on forgetting, but I think I may have asked it last time, but I didn't get any responses. Please, 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 I need a volunteer who's willing to share notes with somebody who has it. So, uh, big class, surely somebody has it in their heart to share their notes. That's what I need. Come, uh, come and see me afterwards. Okay, we have another uh, lecture uh, by Debbie Vishak on Egyptian art to look forward to. If you're wondering what's going on here at the side, it's not the local television come to see me, uh, but uh, it's uh, they're taping this class for those who have had to miss this uh, lecture uh, because of the religious policy. Okay, um, before we jump in here, um, I've got this microphone situation that's actually for the recording, um, and so I'm not using the microphone situation that's for the speakers in the classroom. So I just wanted to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Anybody in the back, you might need to move forward a little bit, but um, just let me know if it starts to get too quiet or mumbly, okay? Um, okay, and also, naturally, last class, I did not finish everything I had intended to because it was a ridiculous amount of stuff. Um, but I do want to finish up a little bit on the, with the architecture on the um, origins of the pyramids because it seems like you, you know, if you talk about Egypt, you have to hear a little bit about that. And I know I teased about how I wanted to talk uh, about the revolution in Egypt that's going on right now and how, that, how I've been thinking about that and how that relates to the ancient world, but that's not necessarily what you're here for. And I want to make sure to get through all the material I have. So if we have a few minutes left at the end of class, I will... Uh, throw some ideas out at you. But the one thing that I do, uh, do want to say, or I feel like um, as an Egyptologist and an archaeologist who's been working for 15 years, working and traveling to Egypt, um, on behalf of me and my colleagues, you know, the community that we're part of, I know that in general there's a lot of concern, especially in this country, there's uncertainty and some fear and worry about the future of the country for a lot of reasons, but also about the antiquities. Um, that are in the country right now. And certainly instability is not ideal, but I can tell you that 
the antiquities people in that country are quite serious about what they do. And although they are, as I speak, as we sit here, um, on strike for reform of the antiquities service, which is desperately needed, and they are closing down sites, including tourist monuments, in order to protest for these changes, um, regardless of that, they are quite serious about protecting the sites, and it's not just the people in the antiquity service and the archaeologists, it's also the population at large, I'm not saying every single person there um, cares, certainly they don't, but in general this is a population that does really cherish this heritage and it's most likely um, going to be completely fine. There's already been a number of examples of villagers, local people going out to sites to protect them from some unsavory police elements. So um, we're hopeful, we're hopeful that things will go well and right now I think um, the thing to focus on probably for Egypt is not the fear for the antiquities but the, um, the sort of hope for their transformation into a democracy, FYI. Okay, that aside. Now, um, we were talking about architecture and talking about some of the kind of big ideas of Egypt, I throw a lot of stuff at you. Now we're just going to do a quick, not too quick, but kind of quick, and I might skip over a few of the slides that I put in the PowerPoint just to move it along, um, about the, the relationship of architecture and how we use architecture in the earliest periods to identify the evolution of a central authority that unified the country um, and eventually developed into a single person, the king, as this highly elevated person in charge of the entire country. And how that, the use of architecture, in particular the architecture around the burial of the king, um, reveals to us the sort of changes, the architecture reveals the changes to us and also speaks very importantly to some of the core ideas about this unified central authority and the ideology that it developed around this very hierarchical structure. Um, now we're gonna start, and also I'd like to talk about this because with the pyramids, it's kind of really impressive sort of thing, these pyramids at Giza, and there can be this tendency to people who are less familiar with the history of Egypt to be shocked and to think these must have, um, you know, they came out of nowhere, and certainly it wasn't Egyptians who built them because how could they possibly have done something like this? Um, but in fact, there's a deep history leading up to these pyramids. These three pyramids at Giza are only a handful of um, over 100 pyramids in Egypt. Um, and they are very much part of a deep-seated, um, long tradition in Egyptian culture. Now, starting when um, the River Valley was first populated, around 5000 BC and well into the fourth millennium, um, you had all of these villages spread up and down the Nile Valley and you didn't really have any central authority. It was just kind of local communities taking care of themselves, relating to each other up and down the river. That kind of thing, that sort of peaceful coexistence kind of thing, doesn't really last that long, usually, um, in history. And so what you have starting to happen in different spots along the river, you have certain people in these local communities gaining power and expanding that power over broader and broader areas. Um, and it's a family that's based in the south with, oh, I actually brought my laser pointer today. In the south, in this area, that's what this detail is showing you. It's a family based um, in this area that eventually co uh, coalesces power over the whole south and then over a series of military adventures up to the north manages to subdue the north enough that they ally also underneath the authority of the southern figure. So then you have this unified state and this is when you have the king at the head of this unified state. Now because the family was based here in the south, the local cemetery um, at a site called Ab Abydos, if you're a British, or Abydos, if you're everybody else, um, was their home cemetery, and so this cemetery then became the home for the burials of the earliest kings of Egypt. This is where we have um, some of the most important archaeological information about this period. Here's a Google Earth image of it. Here's those high desert cliffs that frame the valley, the low desert, and then the um, edge of the river valley. What you have here, this is modern agriculture. They figured out how to irrigate aspects of the desert in order to grow kind of less invasive crops. Um, this is a good representation of the tensions in Egypt between prioritizing archaeology and prioritizing food. Um, and you can imagine, food frequently wins out for good reason. Um, but in a site like this, it's done some uh, damage, you can imagine. The material that we're going to look at in this class it's a cemetery that's located out here. It's hard to see in Google Earth because it's things that are underground. Located here on the map. And then the other part that goes with this are the monuments located here, much closer to the edge of the valley. So these early 
burials consisted of two parts. The body was buried in one place, and then there was a separate monument for ritual in another place. Right. So we're going to look a little bit closer at that. Now here is, it's always the problem with this plan. Can you guys see the little gray circles over here? You can see that pretty well? All right, you don't need to see them in too much detail, but this is a plan of the, this cemetery, this early dynastic cemetery deep in the desert at Abydos. And the dating of this, it starts from the north, this is the earliest material, and it moves to the south, and this is the latest. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that archaeologists look at after all the work of digging all this up and mapping it, look at to interpret social processes, right, social change, and also um, social status at different time periods. So what you have over here, see all of these gray squiggly ovals all kind of grouped together? This is a cemetery filled with what we call pit burials. So another thing about archaeologists, very literal, very, very literal. It's very kind of dull, but pit burials. They dug a pit into the desert, um, and this is where uh, the deceased person was buried. This is a typical example of a pit burial. The body is contracted because it's a small space in the pit. No mummification yet. Maybe a little reed matting above and below to kind of protect the body. And then a handful of offerings in um, various kinds of pottery, offerings actually in the jars, and some of the jars just the offerings. So a relatively modest burial, but one that certainly speaks to their sense of an afterlife, right? Now when you look at this cemetery, that's a bunch of very similar sized pit burials, all kind of close together sharing that space. Now what happens through time, this I'm going to show you now this one here, this tomb here, there is a view of this tomb. Now things start to change in the burials, right? Now this is a really important example. First off, this tomb you can see is at the southern side, so it's later. The area of this tomb Lots of space around it, not in the middle of a bunch of other pits. It gets its own space. In addition, it's much larger. Right? It's taking up much more space for one body than a simple pit burial. Also, it's not just a pit burial. All these walls that you're seeing here, these are built walls made of mud bricks and then mud plastered. Right? And then there's some internal work as well. And then along with that, you have all these rooms, most of which were filled with numerous offerings, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vessels and offerings, some from as far as the Eastern Mediterranean, the Levant. <coughs> so this is drastically different, right? This is a, a clear difference of status the, um, at all the different levels. The space, the location of the tomb moving away from the group area, the space that it's allotted for itself, nobody near him around either side, the space that the tomb takes up itself, and the investment of resources, much, much higher, all on behalf of this one person. So this is evidence of this sort of increasing social hierarchization, which is one of the first steps towards moving, um, moving towards the central authority. Now after that, that's the early thing, after that, what happens is you can see, you have this sort of in-between area with these single chambers. These are these early sort of king-like figures before it was clearly a unified state. Single chambers, less complex, but see how open that area is. The statement of status is being made by the privilege of being buried here. No more is this a cemetery for everyone who lives nearby. Only, it's only now the cemetery for a very, very select few people. So this indicates their high status, right? So now that's been established. You get these last three that are right on the cusp. They fit into what we call Dynasty Zero now which is what happens when you're an archaeologist and you think you found the first king of the first dynasty and then you find somebody before that. You have to create something called Dynasty Zero. But it is sort of right on the edge of unification. And you can see they're still pretty consistent. And then all of a sudden you get this, right? Big, dramatic difference again. These are all what these are showing you overhead. These are all underground, mud brick lined pits, much deeper much bigger, taking up much more space. And not only that, in the case of Hor Aha, who was the first king, he's got these three large chambers, one for himself. He's got these two um, and all of these additional chambers. These held thousands of vessels and other kinds of offerings, including here, a couple of young lions, not easy to come by in Egypt, and as well in these chambers here, two attendants, i.e. human attendants, people who worked for, were close to the king during his life, were sacrificed and buried with him in death. This being, of course, the ultimate expression of power, that the king can have people sacrificed and buried with him, and the community is like, yay, king, and it's not a problem, right? 
Now this happens for a while. This is the way the cemetery moves this through Dynasty 1 to here, and then these two are Dynasty 2. This is the latest one in the cemetery. So in all cases here, what you're seeing are large chambers for the burial of the king, surrounded by all of these subsidiary chambers, filled with offerings and filled with human sacrifice, attendants, members of the court. Max is out at, I think, 162 with one of the tombs, but he's got another couple hundred at his enclosure. Huge part of the population. Um, this fades after the first dynasty. This isn't the kind of tradition you can maintain, clearly. Um, first of all, you keep killing off all the people who are in support of the central authority, uh, but also it's far too traumatic for a society to maintain. But this is an, a really emphatic expression, aggressive, right, of unified power and control and authority. And all of that you're reading through this. Just to give you a quick, quick look at the architecture here now is the view um, you can see little people for scale back here of one of these um, Dynasty One burials, all mud brick, the main chamber at the center with the subsidiary burials all around it, all built together at the same time, all roofed at the same time. That's how you know these people were sacrificed, right? Not buried whenever they died. All of them um, buried at the same time with access on a ramp for the um, burial here. Now, the interesting thing about these, the, the, all of this, right, would have been underground. Nothing survived above ground but by the time the archaeologists got to work on seeing what was happening here. This is a sort of hypothetical reconstruction that's based on bare minimum of evidence. But what it's partly based on is what they did discover. This is a German excavation, and the Germans are killer archaeologists, let me tell you. Um, and they're still working on it right now. Um, one of the things they discovered in re-excavating the cemeteries of this site is that after the burial was done and they sealed over the whole top of it, they actually built a small mound over the whole of the king's burial chamber, not over the uh, subsidiary things here, built a mound that had a little brick skin to kind of hold in this mound of rubble. It was just like a solid mass, little brick skin mound on top of his burial that was then buried underground. It was clearly buried under the ground surface. So this is an interesting thing, right? Why bother building this mound on top of the burial if you're not going to be able to see it above ground? And clearly it has significant religious, spiritual meaning, right? Why bother otherwise? And it seems the most likely explanation, if you remember back to the um, conversation about the creation story for the Egyptians, I told you on Monday, the idea of that primeval mound. Right, the primeval mound that emerges from the waters of chaos to be the spot of creating the new world. The king is buried under the primeval mound, right, so he can emerge onto the primeval mound and be recreated. It's a related concept, and the mound above the king's burial seems to be essential to the meaning of the burial this early on. And this is important because this is what leads to a pyramid, right, in part eventually. So this suggested superstructure is based on that idea. It's also based on the discovery of these stelae, these are tall stone monuments, like tombstones, thin, big, like this. Each pharaoh had a pair of these stelae, and they were found out in the cemetery, which suggests that they were set up to at least mark the spot of burial, so that they weren't, the body had, didn't disappear. And if ritual needed to be done, it could, it could be identified. Um, they're suggested here. So it's possible there was a superstructure, but it's definitely not for certain. The part of the, um, oh, this is just one quick detail, I would go into this more, but one of the really interesting things about this site and about the way these tombs are set up is the um, very vivid and evocative landscape here at Abydos. You see the high desert cliff here? Um, you could see in the overhead the way it was kind of an angle. What you see here, this is an ancient riverbed, right, that cut through that cliff and came down into the valley. It creates what we call a wadi, that's a riverbed, and it kind of curves through. It's really amazing when you're there. It's, the desert goes back and then it's sort of like one of, a road, like in a painting, and then just disappears, right, off into the distance. That's the west bank, that's where the sun sets, right, and so it's clear that they associated that passage as some sort of passage to the next world following the sun because all of the tombs, first of all, they're all moving towards that spot, right? Here's the orientation. This dark one is this here. They're all oriented towards that wadi and they all leave this space open so they can get out of their tomb and access that path. So the landscape is a really important defining aspect. It defines part of the architecture, and it's also a really important meaningful aspect. Right? They're buried here. This place is sacred and spiritual because of the landscape, and this is something they're going to lose when they move north. This is the other element of the complex. 
Uh, this is a close-up. This is down near the valley. Here are the plans. They were all built side by side. Each pharaoh who has a burial in the cemetery in the back has an enclosure up here in the front. And the other thing that um, we discovered, I've worked at this site a couple times, I'm hoping to go back in January actually, is that the, um, there would only be one of these monuments standing at a time. I'm not sure how long it stood, but for certain it was, the one was torn down before a new one was built for the next king. Sort of like a king is dead, long of the king kind of idea, it seems. Now the one that remains standing was built for the last king of the second dynasty, Kasa Kamui, the largest by far. Um, we call these enclosures, that thing that I said about very literal, because it seems that what these monuments are mostly are big walls that enclose space. Um, there is evidence in most of them for some kind of little ritual building right inside, but clearly, and these have been excavated, let me tell you, that interior space, open, no evidence of anything else. So what these monuments, and these, this wall in particular, these are people for scale down here. Big, big high, very thick, heavy wall, lots of mud bricks to, fill, to make this thing. Um, it seems that the job of these walls was to enclose a space, right? They made big walls to enclose the space because they're near a village. So what is happening here is that no doubt there was ritual activity, right, that occurred in this space. They built the wall to hide the ritual activity to the people in the community, but they needed something visible to the people in the community so that they knew there was ritual activity going on that they weren't allowed to see, right? It's a giant visual symbol of hiding something to establish and express this privilege and this status and to keep everybody else aware, you're not, you're not important enough to see this, right? And along with that, the, the doorways into these spaces, little teeny tiny narrow doorways into wide open spaces. So it's a really interesting kind of play with something overt and dominant visually in the landscape that is intending only to hide. So the wall itself is sort of hiding in this mystery of ritual activity. Now Casa Kamui, the last king of the second dynasty, was buried in Abydos. We know his successor was Djoser because there's evidence of Djoser burying him in Abydos. And then Djoser gives up on the southern site, right, and he moves north. The northern site, some of the second dynasty kings had done this as well. The northern site, much more strategic, and the king had to relocate there, despite the importance of the southern site, um, especially for the trade and connections with the Middle East at this time, but much more strategic, controlling the flow of the river down. So he moves to the north, and now he's going to build his funerary monument in the north. And between Casa Kamui and uh, Djoser, we see again another big leap here. Um, here's up here, and Memphis. Memphis is the sort of general ancient capital for most of the Old Kingdom. There are, several, there are several cemetery sites along the desert associated with Memphis. This is an overview of Saqqara. This is just showing these early dynastic burials of the local community. It's not important. Here now is the complex of Djoser. This is what he built, all right? Again, a big leap forward. Much, 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 much bigger. Much bigger, much greater investment of resources. And along with that, it's not mud brick, it's made out of stone. Building something like this out of stone, going to quarry stone, move stone, and build with stone, is way harder and takes a lot more time and a lot more people than baking mud bricks and building with mud bricks. So the use of stone is significant here. In addition, you can see um, the size at work is also extremely significant here. The acreage that the complex takes up as well as the size of the pyramid. Now I would spend more time on this because it's a really fascinating thing, but I just want to hit a couple key points so that I can actually get to the other stuff I have. Um, first off, basically what Djoser is doing, what they're doing here, um, they are con continuing the tradition of Abydos, um, but what they're doing is they're, instead of having the burial and the ritual separate, what they do here is they bring those two things together, right? So he's buried underneath the pyramid, and he's got tons of ritual buildings here, and you'll note this open courtyard in front of the pyramid, right? He's bringing that Ab Abydos open courtyard up here. He's just putting his burial with it, putting all of these things all together so it's one cohesive monument. The pyramid itself, again, this sort of hypothetical reconstruction, what we do know, regardless of whether or not those royal burials in the south had any superstructure, there were elite tombs, and when I say elite, I mean non-royal people, 
who, ha who were nonetheless at the very top of the hierarchy and who had control over vast amounts of resources, which defines a small group, right? There were elite people in different parts of the country who were building these tombs that had superstructures much like this, this kind of solid mound. They're called mastabas. It's a reference to an Arabic word for bench, but it's basically just a solid mound on top of an underground burial with a flat top and kind of battered sides. Those existed in the realm of architecture in the first and second dynasty, just not specifically um, necessarily with the kings in the south, but they did exist in the north at Saqqara. And the archaeologists who have um, worked on this site discovered that initially that's what Djoser had over his burial. That's the first plan, was to build that, and they did build that. And the pyramid, the step pyramid, that eventually um, evolved, took, it took six different stages of building to get to this final step pyramid. Now there's a big debate about why did they do that? Why was he not happy with the mastaba? Why build the pyramid? Sometimes you think it's one of those, what do you mean why? I mean, more is more, right? You're building a pyramid, you want more, you've got more time, you're still alive, keep building, right? Bigger is better. Um, and it's entirely possible. There's a debate about the idea that this mastaba was hidden underneath the enclosing wall, and Joseph didn't like that, or the architect didn't like that, and he wanted to be able to see the spot of his actual burial. So they built up so that it could be seen over the wall. Either way, it's not that it, you know, it happened, um, but it's clearly rooted, almost literally sort of nested, is this mound idea, right? It's the mound idea expanded, much bigger, much larger, and in stone. Now, um, it's gonna, these are the underground chambers. I'm going to skip through this. This is just to reinforce the connection between um, Djoser's architecture and the Abydos architecture that preceded it. This is Casa Kamui's enclosure. Similar proportions, the similar tiny entrance in the corner, similar open courtyard. Right? The ideas are obviously being um, carried forward. Uh, one last thing to point out about this complex. This is oriented north-south. Right, here's the arrow, north-south. Clearly its emphasis is on the north and the south. Beyond that, here's the pyramid. There's a little temple here. This is part of a statue inside the Sirdab here. It's attached to the pyramid on the north side of the pyramid. It's oriented north. The statue of the king is oriented north. And this tells you about the ideology at the time, what happens to the king after he dies. And at this time, the idea was that the king would die and ascend and join the circumpolar stars in the north sky, the ones that don't ever go under the horizon. They're always there. So that was the idea in this early stage. He was associated with the stars, the gods represented in the stars, and he would be there eternally. And that's going to change, and that's another important change. So after Saqqara, the rest of the third dynasty, you have a couple other step pyramids, none that survive as well. And then you get to the beginning of the fourth dynasty. Um, and the first guy, I guess I'm going to go to Giza first, is just to show you. Here's Saqqara in the south. Giza, famous Giza, is located up here. So they're two different sites, right? But they're in the same kind of stretch of desert. And hopefully, ah, and most importantly, I think this is important. This is something you get when you travel there. Because when you study it, you think separate sites, why did they move around? These sites are definitely connected visually, right? You can see, this is from Giza, looking south to Saqqara, and you can see the outline of the step pyramid. It's a little smoggy, but you can actually see the steps. From Saqqara, you can see south to another site, which is actually the first site of the pyramids. You can see back and forth. They're all visually connected. And this is an important aspect of why I think this pyramid tradition really took off up here in this wide open desert that they moved to that they had left this really evocative and distinctive landscape in the south that gave their monuments meaning. And they came up to this wide open desert that's kind of yeah, right? And they built these pyramids all over that wide open desert and they stretched north and south covering a lot of territory in order to transform that landscape into sacred space, right? And then give themselves that sacred space to occupy. And that's an, a really important aspect of the pyramids, the monumentality um, and the visual presence that they have in that space. This is just to show that you don't get right away to Giza, right? Something that's done that well and lasts that long, you don't get there right away. So there were a number of earlier pyramids before we get to Giza. Snefru, father of Khufu, he kept trying because I guess he had a lot of time on his hands. Uh, they tried the Medium one, kind of stepped to re real pyramid and that didn't work out very well. And they tried again here and that didn't work out it started to collapse it's called the bent pyramid because it was like yeah so they had to kind of adjust king was not a fan of the bent pyramid he didn't want to be buried there after they 
went to all the trouble to finish it. Um, and then finally, his third one, the Red Pyramid, they had it much better figured out, right? They figured out the, the solidity of the ground that you needed, the perfect angle to go up at um, to make it work. And that's basically where they were when they moved to Giza to start building. So Neferu's son came to Giza. Giza has this fantastic rock formation, a, a sort of high ridge right below a kind of dip that then rises up again to the valley. So the pyramids are built on this ridge that's very close to the valley. It's an ideal site, um, which is why it was so popular. So Khufu builds here, then his son leaves, and then another son comes back, Khafra, and then his son leaves. Um, so these three, Khufu, Khafra, and Menkara, all build their pyramids here. Now, why a true pyramid instead of a step pyramid? Again, a little bit up for debate. Um, there is an idea that it relates to this solar sy symbol. There was a solar symbol that was a kind of pointed rock um, that was one of those thonic things that sort of came out and had long been worshipped as a solar symbol early in the north and that they were trying to evoke that kind of pointed rock. Um, there's also an idea that there was a sort of tendency towards a minimal visual expression and a kind of geometric um, direction in the architecture and that the pyramid appealed to that aspect as well. These temples with really simple blocky uh, pillars and very little decoration during this period so it's possible as well. But in any case what's clear is that these pyramids connect back to that original mound idea um, and that they have this deep architectural heritage. The most important thing to know about the fourth dynasty, it doesn't start at Giza but it's expressed most clearly at Giza, that they do sort of the reverse that Djoser did. Instead of having everything enclosed, they kind of unpack it all. They put the pyramid, the burial at one end, and they stretch the temples out from close to the pyramid down to the valley, connected by a long sort of built hallway. And along with that, they shift the orientation. Instead of north-south, now it's east-west, and the kings are at the western end. And this is a strong indication, as are the changes in their names from um, something like Djoser to something like Kafra. Um, this is an indication of an ideological change associating the king not with the stars but with the sun. And the worship of the sun god, the union of the king and the sun god, this is a fourth dynasty evolution and becomes absolutely central to the identity of kingship for the rest of Egyptian history. Um, and that's evident here in this architecture, right? It's telling you. It's evident in this architecture. Um, I was going to talk about these more, but I'm not going to now. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Okay, so this is just to sort of reinforce the point of how they got to the pyramids from those early dynastic burials and the architectural, ideological, and ritual consistencies and changes along the way, right? These kings are bringing some things from the past into the future. They're reinterpreting some things, and they're also totally rejecting and changing some things in order to move from one state, one aspect of a centralized state, to a much more powerful centralized state by the era of the Giza pyramids. Isn't that nice? I just like that picture, because now when you go and there's everything's built up around the pyramids and you can't quite get the sense of what it was like, but this is like, oh, oh man. Um, okay, now I want to jump into the visual art oh, much later than I intended to. I put this chronology up there. I. Generally, I'm avoiding the chronology. You can get that from reading. And I also like to avoid this idea of a sort of linear development of art. Like, it starts really bad, and then over time, it gets really good. You know, it's a sort of Greek version of it. Um, not really a workable idea in any era of history. And Western history certainly clarifies that. But it can be useful to have some sense of the different periods. So you can refer back to that. Now, in talking about I'm going to look mostly at uh, relief and statuary right now, two and three-dimensional art. Now, a couple important things to remember when we're looking at, when you're looking at slides like this, right? I, I selected these slides for a purpose, but when you're looking at slides of Egyptian art like this, um, and it's great that you get to go to the museum and see things in person. Um, first off, before I get to the slides, first off, most of what you're looking at was made by and for the elite population of the country. The elite people, the people, I know it's a word used strangely these days, but it means the people at the top who have money and resources. That's what they have, and so they can invest in things like this. We're talking maybe 5% of the population early on expands a little bit over time, but we're talking about a real small sliver at the top, not the mass population of people who couldn't afford things like this. So it's servicing a particular clientele 
um, their needs and their beliefs, and it's important to keep that in mind. The second thing to remember about Egyptian art is that it always has some kind of context. You could look at a little image um, of relief or painting, but that image is on a wall in a structure someplace, a chapel or a temple someplace. Even if it's on a stele, a little mobile stele, that stele was set up someplace in a chapel, in a temple courtyard, in a house maybe. Right? Painting on the side of functional coffins, statuary always designed for specific locations. Egyptians created environments with all of these different pieces. They were not so much about the like, nice painting that you hang on the wall. They did paint their walls and their houses sometimes, but those kind of isolated, separated artistic objects is not really the Egyptian way. They work together in context with other things. And the last thing I want to say about the funerary, you know, this thing about Egyptians obsessed with death. Certainly they were concerned with death, spent a lot of time thinking about death, but the reason that the um, things left to us are so heavily funerary is the nature of the archaeology in the country. Remember I told you on Monday, two different lands, right? Deshret, land of the dead, the desert, Kemet, the valley, the soil, the rich land, the land of the living. Um, that's still the case, right? That hasn't changed. People still live in the valley, they live a little bit on the low desert, but they're not looking to live out in the middle of the desert. They have to live in the valley, they still have to grow food, they still have to be where there's water, which means all of that archaeology is underneath them if it hasn't already been destroyed by thousands of years of flooding, which doesn't happen anymore, and all the other things that are happening. Most of the settlement archaeology, towns, daily life, local temples, is in the valley and can't access it, mostly. So what you can access is in the desert, because who cares what you're doing out in the desert, right? So that's a big part of the reason why it's so skewed for Egypt. Um, hopefully we can sort of improve that in the future, but it is kind of an intractable problem. Okay, so I want to start with two-dimensional art, and just to um, sort of put this into the broader context, and you'll hear this, I'm sure, all semester. When it comes to creating an image on two dimensions, it's an artist, community, whatever, you have a lot of options, right? You have a couple basic options and then everything in between. You can either embrace that two-dimensional surface, right? Confront the two-dimensional surface, be happy with it, and create an image that reinforces the two-dimensional surface. Or you can resist the, the two-dimensional surface and try to create the illusion of three dimensions, and in doing that, connect it more directly to the viewer, because the viewer exists in three dimensions. Now there's options on both, there's lots of variations, lots of different ways of doing these things, of suggesting kind of both depth and flatness and all that. The Egyptians clearly leaned heavily towards the embrace of the 2D surface, right? really were not interested in creating the illusion of three dimensions. They were really interested in embracing two dimensions. Now what that means is, of course, they were still interested in creating images that existed, you know, about Im things that existed in their world, but when you embrace the two dimensions like that, you've got to take things that exist in the world in three dimensions, and you've got to mediate that somehow and reconstitute them in two-dimensional form, right? It's a process that requires thought and creativity and then the execution onto the form. It's not about any kind of direct tracing or trying to evoke what you're looking at. It's a mediated process. Everything, right, has to be transformed from a three-dimensional version into an understandable two-dimensional version. Um, so everything is, right? People, animals, um, architectural spaces, interiors and exteriors, all that kind of thing is all mediated and transformed so that it's comprehensible in two dimensions, so that they can still communicate what they're referencing in three dimensions in two dimensions. Now, along with this transformation of the three-dimensional world, they also really um, utilized the surface of two dimensions, either in a structure or on an object like this, for meaning. They're not limited to the, the surface doesn't have to be used to accurately express space. They can exploit it to express other kinds of meaning, and they do, right? So I want to look at this, start with this, to go over the basics of um, Egyptian visual culture. This is the, what we call a palette. Here you see this little circle that's kind of indented on the back of it. This was actually an old kind of object that was usually much smaller that was used to grind pigments for um, makeup, for people, and for statuary. It was, part of, it was a ritual kind of object used in temple ritual. Um, temple ritual, right. So this is actually big. This one's like this big. It's kind of thick, heavy, not that useful. It's much more of a ceremonial kind of object, but at this stage was um, a traditional object. 
This belongs to a guy named Narmer, who was one of those guys who had like the little chamber at Abydos, but not the whole big thing. He was one of those in between, or trying to unify the country kind of guys. This is an iconic piece because so far, we haven't found anything earlier than this that fully expresses this mode of Egyptian visual culture in two dimensions, the way this does, right? This shows all of the basic aspects that then are used for millennia after, and there's nothing we have so far earlier that does that. So what do you have? You have the figure, and I'm gonna come back to this in a, bit, a little bit more detail in a second, the so-called composite figure um, of the king. One of the things that's clear about the system Scale equals importance, right? This is another way to exploit the two-dimensional surface. Talking about a kind of essence of the person, can't really communicate that when the figures have a, a type, and so scale communicates the status, and there's certainly no question here who the most important person is, right? This king, this proto-king, um, Narmer. In addition, these register lines are used to separate images that are meant to be considered together. It organizes them, they share lines, which means that they share space, they share a moment, they share meaning, they share connection. Separated by lines to then indicate another group of things that share right, a moment or meaning or connection. See them at work here. The piece also uses the top and the bottom significantly. So here at the top you have these cow heads. That's actually a reference to a goddess. She gets the top. She's the goddess. He gets the middle. He's the king. He's the important person. The bottom, these naked, splayed out bodies, enemies, probably not foreigners at this stage, but defeated enemies, the lowest of the low, right? So meaning communicated by where it is on the surface. Um, same on this side. Now this is probably, it probably is referencing some kind of historical, some aspect of historical fact of a battle between these guys in the south and these guys in the north that are indicated here, he's got his hair is being grabbed and he's going to be bashed over the head by the king, right? Uh, no mercy. And this is a, an image, a posture that you see again for millennia in Egypt, the dominant ruler physically dominating over the enemy. Um, and here you see the king attended a bunch of people and he's looking at this display of bodies. Um, that are laid out right vertically but understood to be next to each other on a field with their heads cut off between their legs defeated enemies again now this is most likely a reference right as I was saying to some kind of historical reality but isn't necessarily a specific battle it's hard to say and the, the kind of sort of non-ending non um, conversation about that I think is one of those ways in which we bring our Western perspective to objects that don't necessarily conform because it's possible that he's referring to a battle that's real he's also clearly referring to the idea of battle and dominance and both of those things are happening at the same time how much does the real battle mat matter to what he's trying to say about his dominance and part of the reason you can tell there's a ritual aspect is that this image where he's bashing the guy over the head, he's standing barefoot here while his attendant holds his little sandals behind him. And you stand barefoot when you're standing on sacred ground. Maybe you stand barefoot with an attendant behind you while you're in the middle of a battle. Seems less likely. You definitely stand barefoot on sacred ground. So there's a ritualized aspect to this image. So it's both historic and sort of ritually and ideologically significant at the same time. So lots of um, fun things happening here. Now about the composite figure. I um, just want to say a couple things. We say composite figure because we say that the figure is depicted um, with the different parts of the body shown from different angles or from different views, right? So the torso from the front, the legs from the side. Um, composite, I think, is fine in terms of the idea that the image of the figure is put together with separate pieces. No separate pieces matter. Once you start talking about view, I think you get into a little bit of trouble with Egyptian art. You know, is it really about, the, one of the most common explanations for this is that it's showing parts of the body at their most distinctive. The torso is most distinctive from the front, the legs are most distinctive from the side. I don't know, I mean, is that true? Is the leg more distinctive from the side, from the front? I mean, I'm not sure what that's really about. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced by that argument necessarily. And I think there are other ways to look at it sort of for what it is itself. And I would say to start with, the image as it is, the torso and the legs and the arms, communicates quite effectively the idea of a person, right? It's visually readable, quickly, human person, easily understandable. This is a very kind of basic, common standing pose for the male figure. And I think one of the things that's important about this 
with the wide torso and the narrow waist and the legs is that this is a very stable image, right? It's very balanced. The legs spread apart, the narrow center, and then matched by the wide torso. Um, it's stable, it's static, um, it's, it's very assured. It doesn't seem, there's no movement, there's no shifting, it's just a sort of resting and solid, very balanced pose, and I think that's important. The way that the legs and arms are associated, arms like this on the two sides allow for postures, movement of the arms, holding of objects that are clearly visible. And the legs postured um, in profile like this allow for depictions of movement when necessary, showing the, here, for example, the king running, right? That it facilitates the image um, without ever really losing that core aspect of it. The kind of core balance and solidity of the image is maintained regardless of what happens to the arms or the legs. And I think the construction of the image facilitates that so that the core idea remains while there's still flexibility for the artist to communicate more beyond standing around with the staff. In addition, the profile is visually distinctive, I think, but the profile aspect allows the artist on the two dimensions to relate figures to each other by suggesting visual connection and visual communication, as well as physical connection in some cases. But that profile, very, very important, right? The experience of seeing is extremely important as a meaningful process in any history, certainly in ancient history. The idea of connection between figures depicted because they are visually connected. This figure can see that figure, this figure is approached by these. So the profile really enhances the idea of engagement among the figures on the surface, I think. So there it's, I think it's valuable to think about the other ways that this figure, how this figure functions visually um, and in terms of the content of the figure within the Egyptian system, more importantly than thinking about the different um, viewpoints. I also just wanted to point out a couple details of this very lovely Fourth Dynasty relief. Although this is a conceptual figure, right, it's the concept of the person represented in a non-naturalistic way, the artists use very naturalistic details. So similar to the architecture, right, we're talking about concept and plan, some geometric more abstracted elements, and some highly naturalistic details. So you get things like all the little curls in the wig that he's wearing, really carefully indicated lips and the nose, um, lovely, very soft modeling in the legs to indicate the knee and the musculature of the thigh. Um, this kind of naturalistic detail is used as a tool in an image that is overall not naturalistic, but it's communicating aspects, right, of this human person. Sometimes it's used, you know, it's a stylistic thing, sometimes it's used less, it's one of those things. Um, now, the use of naturalistic detail should not be confused with any um, specific reference to specific people, i.e. portraiture. The Egyptians do not do portraiture with the exception of a few phases, mostly this one phase in the Old Kingdom, um, in any sense in the way that the Western world thinks of portraiture. They're not interested in creating images that look like the person that they're meant to refer to. That's not what they do. Naturalistic details are used to enhance the meaning of the image, but they do not connect that image to a specific person. The way an image is connected to a specific person is through associated inscriptions that give titles and names. Because instead, what you have are these standard ideals. Male, there are a couple of male ideals, always the way, right? There's basically one female ideal. Um, and these are repeated over and over again. Now, over time, things change. The clothing that's used as typical has changed. The proportions of the figure will change. Things will change, but generally speaking, every male figure looks pretty much the same. They might have different wigs and different clothes to differentiate them together, um, but those, again, are about status and, and sort of role within that scene, but not related back to the person, right? They do not, they're not interested in relating this image specifically back to a person. So now, if you piece all of these things together, Right? What, how can you think about Egyptian art in, in two dimensions like this? This is a wonderful stela of Nefert Iabet. Um, seated in a seated posture here. She's seated before a table that is covered with bread loaves. And this is actually a stele that would have been set up in her tomb indicating a spot for ritual activity. So she's sitting before a table, right? Because the idea is that this is the spot where priests would come and make offerings to her. Um, now, Okay, let's go through, skip that, okay. Um, so an object like this, 
clearly associated with this woman, Nefert Yabet. Her titles and her names are all over it. It's a beautiful, lovely piece with like, a huge investment of time and effort right, to carve and paint this piece. So it does represent Nefert Yabet. She needs it to represent her because she needs the offerings to be made for her, right, because she needs that off those offerings to survive in the next world. But this isn't an image of Nefert Yabet in that kind of simple way. right? This is an image of this woman, which is woman, gender matters, um, for the Egyptians in the next life, who is this person, Nefert Yabet, but more than just that physical body, she is a member of a society, a community. She's a, an Egyptian, right? She, she's a believer in the religion, in the worldview. She's part of this system. Right? She's an, a righteous Egyptian who is a true believer, who deserves whatever you know, she's going to hopefully get from this. She's part, she's connected to her family and her kin and this community. That's what this image communicates. It's not just her. Right? It's her as a correct, functioning, connected member of this larger community. And along with communicating that, those other aspects of her, the image is also meant to endure. Right? And this is an important thing to think about with Egyptian art and this two-dimensional material especially. Um, and I, one of the ways I think is good to think about is to contrast it to the kind of ideal of Western perspectival art. So a painting by Raphael, I love this painting. So this painting really hammers home the kind of ideal, I think, behind perspectival art with the curtain drawn back and the ledge for the little angels on the bottom. Right, the, the sort of idea behind perspectival art, and I'm horribly simplifying it, but it's somebody else's job to do that. Um, to expand on that. Um, the idea, right, the single point perspective for the artist is to recreate a view that one person has at one moment in time. That experience of seeing by one person at one moment in time and in that way connecting you personally into the image in a very intimate way. Now this idea is utterly foreign to the Egyptians. They're not interested in one person or one moment in time, right? They're interested in the group, the person as part of the group, enduring across time, right? The images are speaking to these kind of essential truths for the Egyptians that won't change, whoever's looking at it, whenever they're looking at it. It's not about temporary and it's not about the individual. Um, and I think that's a good way of sort of um, leaning towards, like thinking about the Egyptian um, system of two-dimensional art. Right, the kind of different priorities and the different needs and the reasons that they never embraced something like the illusion of three dimensions because it wasn't part of what they were thinking about, their needs, their own desires. Now the statue, I'm gonna move on to some statuary. Oh, except I did wanna say, just throw out there, um, I've thrown enough, I think probably out there at this, but my, I used the word ma'at in the title of this um, lecture. And the ma'at is, the, is an Egyptian word that means order, essentially, but really it means justice, truth, correctness, right? And so it was an essential aspect of Egyptian philosophy, that if you followed ma'at, if you behaved correctly, if you were right and just, fair, you did what you were supposed to, then everything would be okay. The society as a whole, as a whole had to follow ma'at in order not to fall into chaos, but each individual was also responsible for following ma'at. The root of the word is related to a sailing word, actually, that they use. That if you have the boat, you're sailing the boat, and everything is done just right, then you achieve ma'at. I don't know if anybody sails at all, but you know how sailing is a little tricky business, and you have to keep adjusting in order to get a kind of true sail and to be able to sail smoothly. And you constantly have to readjust and do the right things given changing circumstances. That's a good metaphor for the idea of Ma'at. And I think the idea of Ma'at is very much present in the visual system, right? The idea of balance in the images, the idea of the correctness of the figure of communicating these kind of social values. Um, Ma'at is very much an underlying aspect of the nature of the, both the two and three-dimensional art. Now, just to jump ahead to not jump ahead, to move ahead to statuary and some of the basics about statuary because here we are working in three dimensions. We can talk a little bit more. The same thing with two dimensions, they're all two dimensional arts. The functional aspect is very important. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more with the statuary. Um, for Egyptians, statue, statues function in a number of different ways, but at core, the cults, the religion was structured around a statue. This is not about worshiping statues, right? The idea is that a statue was the main focal point 
the cult of a god, or say the cult of a pharaoh who becomes god after he dies, and by extension the cult of any elite person who died and who could afford a statue. The idea behind the statue is that the statue is a vessel, a, a vessel for the spirit of the god or of the deceased person, um, king or otherwise, to inhabit in order to connect between the world of the other and the world of the living. And the reason this was necessary is because it was thought that for the gods in particular, that the gods could only sort of pass on the good works that people needed if they actually came into the human world. They needed to enter into the human world, then they could do what they needed to do to help the country go along. With the deceased, they needed to come into the human world to be able to access the offerings that were made for them, incense and food and beer, um, that kind of thing. So there needed to be a point of connection between the two, and the statue is the vessel for that connection. Now, what is about this posture, right? A lot is made of this posture. This is a classic kind of statue with the foot forward, um, classic Egyptian posture. The, this posture with the foot forward indicates it's a funerary statue. Gods sometimes have this because gods can do whatever they want, and generally, actually, we only have maybe three statues of gods that have survived at all from Egypt because statues of gods usually were small and made of gold. Those are the first things to go. So not so much survives on those. But um, stone statues of lesser people survive. Now the idea of the foot forward. Um, here we have Menkara, the builder of the small pyramid at um, Khafra. Now the foot is forward, but the back, the right, right, I always got my left and right. The, my right, the right heel is flat. So the foot is forward and the right heel is flat. And a lot has been made about this, like the Egyptians couldn't figure out gravity or movement or whatever. But in a piece like this, the top of the rung in terms of artists and effort, because you're doing it for the king, when you go and see this piece, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, um, what you see when you stand in front of it is that not only is the foot forward, the faces are forward, but his face is actually slightly off axis, turned off axis. Now, the degree to which the care that is taken, right, in making the statue, things like this are not mistakes. And you can also detect, they can detect slight shifts in the body, right, just bare slight shifts in the body. So what the statue is communicating or attempting to communicate is standing still and moving forward at the same time. So why is the statue trying to communicate that? Because the statue exists both outside of ritual, sitting in the temple or sitting wherever, waiting to be ritually activated, and it exists in the ritual, being ritually activated. And it needs to function in both ways. For the Egyptians, these rituals, super elaborate rituals of trying to get the spirit of the god or the deceased into the statue because it was understood to be scary. You don't want to leave heaven or you're, you know, where the gods are to come hang out in Egypt where it's kind of scary, so you have to lure them in with all of this work and this effort and offerings and incense and sweeping things and flowers and whatever. And you try to get them there and you convince them to come and then it's this very fraught time while you have a god in front of you in the statue. Ritual is done and then the god leaves. But you don't want the statue inhabited by a god or a dead person when you haven't made the, you haven't set the stage, when things haven't been taken care of. You only want that happening under very controlled circumstances. Same thing for the deceased. You don't want the deceased sort of stuck in the statue and things could go haywire and you don't, you know, you're not controlling it through the ritual activity. So the statue needs to not look like it's moving all the time. It needs to look like it's mostly static, waiting. But it needs to look like it has the potential to be imbued with agency and energy. It has to have that aspect as well. So both things are meant to be present in the statue. Now most times when you see a statue like this, you'll see tons of them, lower level elite people, whatever, not so much with the careful detail with the body and the face and all that, because all of that for them is communicated in the posture of the one leg forward and one leg back, right? Both at the same time. Now I, unbelievably, I'm going to skip that, love that though. Um, this you can actually see in the museum, fantastic to see in person, and so much better than this horrifying gold back slide. So I will let, leave you to see that in the museum. Um, talk about it there. Um, oh no, I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Now, images of the king are central to Egyptian ideology and also to the body of work that survives to us, because the king gets images made of him more than anybody else, including the gods. Mostly, it's of the king. So the images of the king vary. Like the one I was just showing you, that's a very standard ideal. Same for an elite man. Youthful, 
strong fit, right? This is the ideal for a ruler for anybody, for everybody always, right? Um, that's the ideal, but there are variations over time depending on changes in the political circumstances, social context, trends, influences from outside, whatever. Now this is one of the most dramatic examples, and there are a couple statues of him in the Met as well. This very distinctive face that belongs to statues of a ruler named Senwazwit III. Now this is the kind of statue, and in fact this piece in particular is the kind of piece that Western textbooks invariably select when they're illustrating Egyptian art. Because they love this, they're like, oh my god, they almost got it, right? It's naturalistic, it looks like a person, yay, and then it all fell apart again. So sad. But they, this is like evidence that, you know, there was something there. It wasn't all a waste, those 3,000 years. Um, because there are these naturalistic details that indicate a kind of personal quality, an emotional quality. The drooping eyes and the bags under the eyes and the kind of mouth like this. So you look at that and you think, well, maybe they did shift into portraiture for this era, right? It's possible. But then you have to look at the bigger picture. There are examples of him with the full head. And then you look at the ears and you think, hmm, like maybe. Maybe he had gigantic Mickey Mouse ears and they just had to capture that in the statuary. And they were like, you know, horizontal to his head instead of normal, but possible. But then when you put the whole thing back together with the figure, this old, tired face still has, you know, a smoking hot, youthful body, right? Confusing. Because the idea is still communicating something about the king, about kingship. In this case, you can go with a lot of the text from this period, the 12th dynasty, a challenging period for the Egyptians, about instead of about the glory of the king and how awesome it is to be king, which doesn't always play well with your 90% population working in the fields, about the burden of kingship, about the difficulties and the responsibilities and how hard it is, and how he worries. He's the shepherd of his people and worries on their behalf and goes to the gods and tries to help them. This is a part, a changing part of the ideology of kingship and it is not surprising that it is then present in the face of the statues, right? Have these moments, and the, the one that's most um, common, I'm gonna come to in a second. I do wanna show you guys the Hatshepsut statues that you can also see. This is awesome why you get to go to the Met, and frankly, you should spend you know, all weekend there. Um, remember Hatshepsut and her building and her annoyed stepson who hacked all that stuff out? One of the other things he did was he destroyed all the statuary and he buried it right in front of the temple because he didn't really think about the whole archaeologist of the future thing. So the archaeologists come back to the temple and they find a pit and it's filled with pieces of broken statuary that were all broken at once and buried together, which never ever ever happens because normally the statue is just eventually kicked over and disappears and you get pieces all over the world, right? It's a whole pit filled with broken statuary buried right after she died, essentially. Huge, awesome find. So essentially there is more surviving statuary of Hatshepsut than anybody else except for Ramses II. And it is the ultimate irony, and I'm sure Thutmose the Third is turning over in his grave, but there's a whole room of it in the Met. They have several really fantastic pieces um, because her, her, body of, her body of sculpture is fascinating as she goes from being um, a, just the regent and she's depicted basically as a you know queen she's wearing a dress and she's still feminine but she's wearing the headdress of the king and as she sort of moves through her reign here she's wearing male like a male kilt and a male collar but retains a little bit of the femininity of her body right she's sort of negotiating does she need to retain her gender in these images but she's king and she needs to be understood as king and she eventually does have a bunch of images of herself where she is depicted as the ideal male figure, right? It's an interesting, it's, it's a really fascinating. You can see that whole great room of um, statuary in the Met if it's open. Now this is the one, um, the famous one that people talk about um, with Egyptian art because this is an era of art in the New Kingdom that looks quite distinctly different, right? Here and here. Two images, a statue and a relief of a ruler called Akhenaten. Now Akhenaten was a revolutionary ruler of his time. He um, is often referred to as the first monotheist because he rejected the idea of worshiping all the different gods of Egypt. He didn't exactly outlaw it. He was mostly opposed to Amun-Ra, um, probably because the priesthood of Amun-Ra represented a real threat to his power. Um, but he rejected the idea of all these multiple gods and he focused his attention on a single god. Um, sun, a version of the sun god called the Aten, which is basically a reference just to the disc. So he's worshipping now a kind of disc as opposed to an anthropomorphized god. So he changes the religion. I'm going to come back to this in a second. He actually 
moves the capital. He leaves the civic capital in the north and he leaves the spiritual capital in the south and he creates a new city in the middle of Egypt. Brand new. Built up for him. They use it during his reign after he dies. Abandoned. Fascinating archaeological site right now as well. Um, so, and he, he reigned for about 17 years. So, really, to mess with people's religion that drastically, really, really tough thing to do. And that was just the tip of it. Political revolution. This was a really amazing era. Definitely roots before him, but he really, you know, put it out there. So, along with all of these changes, he developed these different kinds of images where he is depicted in a much more feminized form as opposed to that more idealized male image typical of the ruler with this little skinny waist and this round belly and hips and little spindly chicken legs at the bottom, right? Visually very dramatic, different kind of art. Now this is the kind of art that tends to um, elicit this kind of commentary. Uh, this is from a couple years ago. A Yale University doctor has concluded that the pharaoh's female form was due to a genetic mutation that caused the body to convert more male. Yale, they must be so proud. Um, so the idea is that by looking at a two-dimensional relief image of the pharaoh, you can identify a genetic mutation. This is a huge topic, and there are Egyptologists that talk about it. Um, the idea is, right, with Egyptian art, they're not depicting the person. Right? They're depicting ideas and concepts. It would be bizarre if a guy who was this revolutionary in his time didn't create art that looked drastically different. Right? And he didn't even leave it that far. He just did this whole feminized and really curvy, soft lines with everything. Did something really different. Um, and this is important. There's something sort of deceptively simple about Egyptian art. Right? It, it lures you in and you think it's this kind of simple-minded children's literal thing. But just to remind you, right, it's not just Akhenaten. When you guys see this statue in person, I mean, you look at this statue with these kind of giant block knees and huge tree trunk feet. It's like, well, who's going to diagnose him? You know, what's wrong with him exactly and whatever. And then you have to think about Hatshepsut, and then you have a whole other set of issues. Like, she's being depicted like this, and there's another, you know, maybe that's more a psychological thing. I don't know. But there's plenty of examples throughout Egyptian history of the images proof of the images being used to communicate ideals, ideology, right? Spiritual and religious significance. They're not just drawing on the walls what they see is standing next to them. Um, I think that's important. Now, that last thing I wanted to show you, um, oh, I was going to show you Tut, but Tut's kind of, eh. Just wanted to mention before you go, this one last thing, this really cool site, if you're interested, if any of you, I don't know if any of you are artists or interested in fine arts at all, um, there's this fantastic site on the West Bank in Luxor called Dir al Medina. This is an overview of the West Bank. This is the Valley of the Kings up here, where the kings were all buried in the tombs that I didn't show you. The temples are down here. Here's Dir al Bahri, Hatshepsut's temple. If you come around the cliff here, you see this. This is what remains. It's a super important site for us because it's one of the few settlement sites that archaeologists have been able to access because it's in the desert. So a lot of stuff comes out of this really it's overweening and what we know about it but what's really cool about this site is that this village was built to house the workers who built and decorated the royal tombs um, so it's the artists the ones who painted the walls of these elaborate royal tombs in the valley of the kings that all lived here with their families um, so it's a really it's a it's like an artist commune right set out here in the desert and we actually have tons of stuff great letters and stories and things and the fights that went on you can imagine small village small town if any of you from a small town all kinds of fights all the time annoyed about pay annoyed about this and that but one of the great things here is that they built their own cemetery instead of their cemetery being far away from them here's the town site and that's the cemetery up in the hills it's right there on top of them basically um, and they decorated their own tombs. They're decorated for each other. So like the quarry guy who was really good at quarrying got the really good painter guy to come do his tomb because he quarried his tomb, right? So there's this sharing of um, skill. But then you get to go into these tombs if you visit there, but for them, whatever. These kind of small tombs, you can get right up to the walls and the quality of art is insane. It's all, you know, a lot of Egyptian art, is, especially um, in the New Kingdom with the painting, is very carefully laid out and measured register lines, proportions of the figures. They want to be sure, right, for their wealthy patron that everything is done exactly right and the tomb functions okay. But these are tombs, you know, these are the creme de la creme of the artists, and they come in here and just do these incredible, vivid, 
images drawing on things that actually exist at this time only in the royal tombs because they have access, they know what goes on in the royal tombs, and they bring them into their tombs. Um, it's really a, it's a beautiful set of tombs, a really beautiful um, painting, and really fascinating to try to um, connect some of these tombs to the actual royal tombs and to see if we can trace some of the work of the artists because identifying artists is something that we really can't do very well in ancient Egypt. Uh, they weren't really about signatures so much, with a few rare exceptions. Um, okay, so the last thing I just wanted to make this last um, point end with this image of the Ptolemaic rule. I'm sorry I skipped over some other stuff. Um, Egypt in, from the Narmer's Palo, which is just after 3000 BC in that artistic style with lots of change and variation along the way, endured through the loss of Egyptian control over their own country, Libyan rulers, Nubian rulers, Greek rulers, Roman rulers. All of them, up through the Romans, came to Egypt happy to conquer and control and collect taxes and grain, but they all continued in the visual and material culture traditions of Egypt. Egypt was their or culture, right? They did their own thing. You're gonna see tons of Greece and Rome. They did their own thing, but in Egypt, they did the Egyptian thing. They followed that, those traditions. It just tells you how um, enduring, uh, how, how, what an impact they had on the Mediterranean world um, and all of these huge superpowers that came. But this effort, these Greeks and Romans and the earlier Egyptians and then all the people that came after up to and including the Egyptians that are there right now, this effort to look to the past, right? This is how things move through time. This is how history occurs because people purposely look to the past and they choose to bring things forward. And they might change things, right? Or they might interpret things differently, but this is the process of history, a constantly dynamic process, right? You're looking to the past, you choose to bring something forward and you stop with the religion and you're not building temples anymore. You look to the past and you reinterpret it, you write about it, you bring it into your own world. It becomes a tourist site, it becomes a site of mystery, it becomes a site to bring your crystals and your like, hope for an alien ship or whatever, but it becomes each choice, right? This is how these things are brought into the future. This is how history exists for us. And this is why we know in Egypt, despite the revolution, these modern Egyptians, right? This is another step, essentially, in the world of ancient history, as well as modern history. These guys, this moment, this is gonna affect how we understand the ancient world and how they're gonna choose to continue to bring it forward for all of us this time. Um, okay, thanks, sorry, a little bit late. Thank you.